I'd like to begin <coughs> with a couple footnotes. You know, footnotes are usually in the bottom of each page, which we usually don't like to read. But I have to tell you, footnotes are sometimes the most important things. So let me just share a couple footnotes at the beginning. The first one, it is a delight to be here, to see you. I'm a little bit nervous seeing all these important ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. But uh, we are a family and hopefully we are all together and help each other. And I'm delighted to stay here in this beautiful home, to be the guest of Nancy and Jack. They're wonderful people and we enjoy our island, I think it's the right term. It's not your island, it's our island. I was told when I crossed the border. And so we are here to celebrate. Secondly, it was already mentioned, and you have discovered it, that my name is Manfred Kohl. I'm from Germany. And my English is a little bit, what do you call it, off, off the beat. We understand you fine. <laughs> so far, uh, <clears throat> because I have practiced that. <laughs> but what I would like you to really listen carefully, because my accent is is an advantage for me. People have to listen more carefully, otherwise they don't get it. You know, the, the man who just spoke, his English is perfect. You, you almost can fall asleep. But when I speak, you have to listen very carefully, otherwise you don't get it. So I'm very happy. Today is uh, number three. Uh, today is August the 17th, and it was mentioned already. It is my wife's birthday, and we are very happy to celebrate that in our island. But I also have to mention something. Today, on August the 17th, in 1957, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So I'm, that's my spiritual birthday, and I'm celebrating 63 years walking with the Lord, which I'm very grateful and thankful to him. Let me say a few sentences about myself. As was already mentioned, I was born in the midst of the Second World War, terrible, terrible time. What happened in, in Germany under the demonic power of Hitler was, was awful. The time right after, when I grew up after the war, I know what starvation is. For months, my family, mom and dad, and my older brother, younger sister, we had to eat grass and bark from the tree for months to survive. We still remember in the first care packages from North America, Canada and the US came. We celebrated that as Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthday, and everything else. Mm -hmm. It was so very special. But I was born into a family that made furniture. My family goes back to 1500. And many of my grandfather, great-grandfather, and all the way back, they were all involved in making beautiful furniture. <coughs> Not like that, I mean beautiful furniture. And I had to learn to make furniture. My first degree is making furniture. I made a desk, a masterpiece. So I'm a master cabinet maker. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ, as a child, I, I learned how to play in the workshop to get sawdust in your eyes and splinters in your fingers and I even cut one of my fingers, chopped it off by mistake. But that means I came from a tradition that was down to earth. Because if you work with, with wood, if you make a beautiful piece of furniture, uh, you, you, you are not up in the, in the academic world. You are down on earth. 
with four feet. And that's what I had to learn. And I think that's part of my life. To be very practical, down to earth, simple. It helped immensely. It was already mentioned that I had a chance to write in several articles for the journal here, which I appreciate very much. Especially the article, The Boy Called Jesus. Many people say we don't know too much about the childhood of Jesus. Yes, we do. How he began as a refugee. How he was down in Egypt. How he learned from his mom and from his dad most important things in life. There was no school and there was no textbooks and there was no internet and, and, and all the other information that we have. They had to learn from mom and dad. And we know what he learned because he used it later on in his life. How many men know the importance of yeast and salt and flour and all the other things that he mentioned again and again in his sermons he learned from his mom and dad i enjoyed writing on as i or as you already heard how i found the, the last will of luther in a in a library an archive in the city of budapest in hungary just by mistake Incredible discovery. I wrote about it and not just a few things that Luther had, who should get it, but how he cared for his wife, how he cared for his children, how he was sad when one of his children died. All that was in that last will. If you have not read it, be sure you get a copy of it. Then it was already mentioned that we will have some question and answer period. My friend, I would like every one of us participate. It's not just me speaking and you can boo or clap at the end. No, no, we would like to have a, a family discussion. And we will do so. By the way, I have a little gift for each one at the end. If you participate in the discussion. So there's a condition before you get the gift. So these are just the footnotes I like to mention at the beginning. I called the presentation the beginning of the Lausanne movement. I'd like to begin my presentation with a question. What is evangelism? Would you take a moment and just reflect on that and come up with a brief statement about what you believe is evangelism? Not what the book says and not what your teacher said and not what you heard from the pastors. What do you think is evangelism? Very simple. Don't give me the, the Latin or the Greek background. Just tell me what you think is evangelism today. Anyone like to, to answer that question? Pastor, what is evangelism? Making disciples of Jesus Christ. Making disciples of Jesus Christ. All right. Anybody else? Fortunately, we have now name tags, so I can call on each one. <laughs> so don't be shocked. And if you don't know the answer, don't get red and embarrassed. You're just a family, okay? Yes, sir. Proclaiming the good news of Christ to others. Declaring the good news of Christ to others. All right. Anybody else has a better answer? Not a better answer. Pardon? Not a better answer. Okay. I got an answer from a different viewpoint. Um, isn't it just to allow Jesus to live through you? Did you all hear that? No? Say it again, loud. Isn't 
isn't it just to allow Jesus to live through you? To allow Jesus to live through you. Okay, that's a yes. I'll try and combine the last two answers. Is that sharing the gospel or sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in word and deed? So it's, it's proclaiming the gospel verbally, but also demonstrating the good news of the gospel through how you live your life, through letting Jesus live through you. Okay. It's, it's, it's a demonstration in word and power. It's important that you add not just the good news, but the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We have so many good news all over the place. Everyone says he had the best good news. Good news of Jesus Christ in word and deeds. That's a good answer. They're all good. Anybody like to add one? Because we come back to the term of evangelism. Because Lausanne is a movement of evangelism. My involvement with the concept of evangelism began in 1971 with the publication of Lagoon in the Pacific, the story of truck, very simple book. As a member of the international board of the Liebenzell Mission, they are in Germany as well as in the US, I visited the islands of Micronesia several times and decided to write about one island. Now Micronesia, a whole group of small islands, not as big as yours, very small islands, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. If you take North Japan, South Australia, Philippines in the West and East Hawaii, and you just make, come to the center of, of these four parts, right in the middle are the islands of Micronesia. And the missionaries went there, for sending the gospel, people got converted, and the church began among these wonderful people in Micronesia. And I took the time to write a book on, on how the mission came, how to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, how people got converted, and how the whole island changed. And to my surprise, that little booklet was selected to be the textbook for all the schools, public schools in the islands. A book on mission, evangelism, presenting the gospel of Jesus was used as a textbook for all the children in all the islands of Micronesia. A new way of evangelism. I will tell you a little bit more later on. Led by Billy Graham, a group of individuals met during the 60s and early 70s to discuss how the Church of Jesus Christ could be challenged, motivated, and changed to practice the Great Commission given by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 28. You know that phrase, it's the Great Commission. For many, many churches and Christian organizations, it's the great omission. They are omitting it. They are forgetting it. Among these evangelicals, these leaders, was the British theologian John Stott from London, England, the Anglican Bishop Dane from Sydney, Australia, the American theologian and editor of Christianity Today, Carl Henry, Donald Hart, the founder and president of the um, Tokyo Christian College, and evangelist Leighton Ford, and he's the only one who is still alive. There were auditory meetings of like-minded, equally concerned evangelical leaders, the beginning in Montreux in Switzerland in 1960, and then in Berlin and Germany 1966. There were several regional meetings in Singapore in 68, in Minneapolis, the US, in Bogota, Colombia in 69, and in Amsterdam, Holland, our friend from Holland, in 1971. In 1970, Billy Graham 
called for a special meeting in Washington, D.C., the U.S., to share with a few key individuals the idea of a large-scale global congress on evangelism. That was the beginning that anyone talked about that. Up to this point, the various denominations and organizations had no specific emphasis on evangelism. The so-called mainline churches under the umbrella of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland, the many new independent churches around the world and the fast-growing Pentecostal movement and hundreds of mission agencies and parachurch organizations all had various strategies of ministry which were taught in their respective theological institutions, Bible schools and mission training centers. But the theology of evangelism, outreach, searching for the lost, was not specifically emphasized and was quite often missing altogether. It was not being taught in the seminaries, the training ground for pastors and denominational leaders. The subject of evangelism was considered as an elective subject, but not required for every student. We all know that as the seminary goes, so goes the church. I have written on that topic several times, and as already our host mentioned, I have visited 493 seminaries around the world in about 140 countries. And I can tell you there are some wonderful, wonderful theological institutions, and there are some who should be closed. They are disgrace. But there were other topics in the 60s and 70s that had to be addressed along with promoting evangelism as fundamental. There was the ancient, still ongoing debate, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? You remember that phrase? It was said by, or formulated by Tertullian, the North African church father, year 200 many, many centuries ago, he said, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? In today's term, we would say, what emphasis should be placed on academia and what emphasis should be placed on evangelism and outreach as a specific need for the church? Big, big issue. Even today, we focus on what degree does that person have? What kind of school did he visit? How well has he read and listened to all the great speeches? Very few ask the question, how many people did you lead to Jesus Christ? How many people did you bring into God's family? That is just on the side. It is not central. The unending, unending debate as to whether a person should be first fed or first be given the gospel. First humanitarian and social assistance or first mission and evangelism. Huge debate in the 60s and early 70s. Also the continuing challenge of confronting the issues of equal equality of male and female in ministry, which is still going on in some groups today, or the relationship between missionary and natives and nationals. Who has the final say? Or what to do about the rich West and the poor South? Or what is ecumenism and what is unity? These are the debates that focused in the churches, in the theological schools in the 60s and 70s. The city of Lausanne, Switzerland, situated right on the Lake Geneva, was chosen for the meeting and the large Congress Center was booked 
for a July date in 1974. A Congress committee with representatives from 60 nations was appointed. The, the theme for the Congress was, let the earth hear his voice. It was the first global gathering of evangelical leaders ever, and 2,700 and more participated. Time magazine, you know the Time magazine coming out of New York, Time magazine in a special report of several pages, which is quite unique, called the Congress of Forum and probably the most diverse gathering of evangelical leaders to date. They realized it never happened before. Billy Graham was appointed the honorary chairman, Bishop Dane as a speaks executive chairman, Leighton Ford and Paul Little as Congress directors. Leighton Ford wrote, from the outset, Paul and I were convinced that a Congress had to be more than just 10 day gathering but a process which began well before the gathering in Switzerland and would be hopefully flow on after it was completed. It was not an easy task to discern which topic should be addressed at the Congress. Which specific leaders and speakers could be engaged to help us to find a direction for the future. All the speakers were asked to prepare their presentation well ahead of time. And these version of their presentation were sent to all the participants, all 2,700 plus. And everyone was expected to read them and absorb them and return their comments. And then the speakers were asked to use all their comments and critiques finished their final presentation. All the presentation of the great first Congress of Lausanne was published in a book by the Scott journalist Douglas. It is 1,500 pages. Let the earth hear his voice. That's the volume. And it is very, very small in print. But everything is in it. And I will come back a little bit later. But let me ask you another question. What criteria and procedures would you have used to select the more than 2,700 delegates from around the world? Remember, it was the first time ever such a <laughs> Congress took place. What criteria would you have used? Help me come up with some ideas. Anybody? People who are actively involved in evangelism. Good, good point. People who are involved in evangelism, very good. And you already determined what evangelism is, okay? What else? Any other comment? Come on. The diversity of denominations. Yes. As broad as possible. Yes. As I recall, they never looked at any denominational concepts. It was just open, absolute open. They did not say we need so many Baptists and so many Presbyterians mm -hmm. and so many Pentecostals. They did not ask the question. Denomination was never mentioned in the Congress, which was quite unique. Never came across that before. Just the, just the basic walk with God. Basic walk with God. So, but how, how would you select 2,700 people from 185 different countries? Yes, ma'am. It seems like you want people from the Areas, like you want some people to come to a theological education seminary uh -huh. because you want that participation, you want that evangelism to go into that area. Okay, yes, anybody else? Could you advertise the Congress and ask people to nominate people that you think would represent the area well in that 
Okay. At that time, we didn't have internet and all of that. Uh, so advertise uh, would be a little bit difficult, but uh, the idea is correct, yeah? You might want people who can have the means of getting the conclusions of the founders out to the world. So, uh -huh. you, know, I mean, you had Carl Henry, publisher of uh, Christianity Today, people who could take the fruit of the founders and then yeah. People of them. multiplication. Yes. Uh, gifts and efforts, yeah? Okay, good. Let me tell you what the committee did. Each participant had to be well known and be recommended by at least two members of the selection committee. Preference, preference was given to individuals under 50 years of age. We want, they wanted to have younger people. Oh, I was young at that time. Each nominee, nominee must have had some experience in evangelism. You're correct. Especially in developing new ways and concepts to reach the unreached. And here my book, on The Island of Truck, came into focus. And that was why I was invited. Representatives from... Non-Western countries were equal in number to representatives from Western countries. Strong emphasis was placed on including female participants. Usually we always talk about men. Individuals involved in training, ma'am, as you said, such as professors, and teachers, and pastors, who taught others, were given preference. Every person from the West was required to pay their own way. Travel, accommodation, and the fee, and the meals. And scholarship was only given to people from the non-Western countries. There were many, many more requirements. The selection process took many months. I had the privilege of being invited as one of the participants. When I arrived at a Congress Center, the atmosphere was one of excitement and expectation, and it was absolutely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Key evangelicals from nearly every country of the world came to Lausanne. The logistics were more than a challenge. A host of translators, hundreds of journalists and television people, and countless students serving as guides were everywhere. The total, the whole number of the people gathering at the first Congress in Lausanne were far over 4,000 people. Finding the right bus or train to take you to your overnight quarters was a new experience for everybody. You have to remember, people came from India, from Africa, from everywhere around the world. Quite many people have never seen a bus or a train. For 10 days, I traveled every morning and evening to the Mayo's Bible School and on the bus next to me for 10 days was Francis Schaeffer. You probably have heard the name, a well-known a person who has written a lot and started the play in, in uh, Switzerland, and we enjoyed endless discussions and debates. There was also a very large tower, a clock tower, indicating how many new people were added every second to the world's population in comparison a challenge to evangelical evangelistic outreach. That clock went, went crazy. How many people are added? And we talk about, well, <laughs> we added a couple every month. The convocation was opened by John Stutt, the British scholar. And the closing address was given by Billy Graham. 
key presentations were given by, and I give you just a few names, you might remember some. Michael Green, Ralph Finder, Festo Coventry, Francis Schaeffer, Billy Kim, Stanley Mooningham, Michael Cassidy, who is still alive, Christy Wilson, Roger Nicole, Carl Henry, Brian Capo, Rene Padilla, Malcolm Mugerich, and many, many more. The representatives from each country also met separately to make plans for national and regional evangelistic activities. Several strategic reports from various countries were presented. Workshops and follow-up meetings took place during the Congress. 24-hour prayer room was made available and was used by many. The closing session was held in the Lausanne Soccer Stadium, which was filled with people from Lausanne and the surrounding areas. I think there were about 40,000. The message from Billy Graham was entitled, The King <laughs> is Coming. The King is Coming. And many came forward to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. For me, one of the lasting experiences was a prayer. It was offered by Cory Den Boom. You remember that name? Cory Den Boom, a lady from Holland. She wrote a hiding place, which was made in a movie. She was the tramp for God. She traveled around the world to tell people what she experienced in the concentration camps. How her sister was murdered, her parents killed. She survived to tell the world that only in Jesus Christ can we have lasting peace. She was asked to open one of the main sessions in prayer. And at that time, there was just a, a, a lectern. No one else was sitting on the platform, which was quite mm -hmm. unique. They were all sitting down. Only the speaker was up there. Mm -hmm. And so she came up to give that prayer. She walked very slowly to the, to the lectern. And if you know her, I, I had the privilege of meeting her many times. I was working on one of her teams. She was a lady who had very thick glasses. And I was sitting in the back, and I could see the reflection in the glass, the lights on the lectern. Green, you can speak. Yellow, wind up. And red, stop. And I could see it on her glasses. She was standing there, both hands on the side, and she was looking at the people. Like Billy Graham and Leighton Ford and Louis Palau and all the big shots around the world. She looked at them back and forth and then further up and further up and back until she even went to the road that I was sitting. She did not speak. One minute went by. She only had two minutes for her prayer. Two minutes went by. Finally, she closed her eyes, but she did not pray. I could see not only the red light flashing, I could see the people getting very nervous. The speaker realized it is his time that is cut short. Everyone got nervous. And there she stood, eyes closed. Three minutes went by, dead silence. Four minutes went by. Did she have a stroke? Did she forget how to start? What happened? Five minutes. And finally, like the European, she put her hands together like that and she began to pray. And she said something like that. It was so, so dramatic. 
but uh, even today uh, my voice is uh, shaking. She said, Father, my Father, Heavenly Father, our Father, you, you, you look down and you see all of, all of us, every single one. And you probably realize that all of them, all of us, are nothing but blown up balloons. You know, a balloon that children play, blown up balloons. Each one wants to be bigger than the other. Each one wants to be brighter than the other. Each one wants to be higher than the other, and they push against each other that they, they could climb up. But they're all blown up balloons, filled with air. Air of selfishness, self-centeredness. Father, I'm sure in heaven you must have a big needle. Would you please come with your big needle and pop each one of us balloons? Because only if the air is out and if we are broken and flat on the ground can you use us for evangelism. God really spoke to everyone in that gathering. I think it was the turning point of evangelical movement. Many, many got up from their chairs and knelt down and cried out to God. Have mercy on me. It was a tremendous experience for me. After about four or five minutes in the ritual, people were praying and making a new commitment, rededicating their lives. She continued with her prayer and said, Oh God, we know the story of these, these two followers of Jesus who, who left Jerusalem to go home, who were so disappointed and frustrated and did not know what the future will be. They went home to that to the village of Emmaus, and, 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 and the stranger who came along. And when they began to stop talking and listening, their heart was on fire. Lord, help us, she said. Father, help us to learn how to listen to you and not just always talk to you. They did not recognize Jesus, as you know the story, if you have heard of it. Easter Sunday or the Sunday after that we preached on. They invited a stranger to stay with them and became the guest of honor. And when he began to say the prayer and broke the bread and gave it to others, sharing it with others, their eyes were opened. And she mentioned the moment you begin to share God's blessing with others, you see Jesus. But he disappeared and they were so overwhelmed and absolutely beside themselves for joy and happiness. But then, oh God, at that time, you came again with a needle. You put it in there behind and it got up and ran back in the middle of the night to tell others Jesus is alive. Oh, would you please come and give each one of us that shot in the butt and, and the behind. I don't know what uh, title she used. You got a message. <laughs> we have to get that needle to tell others Jesus is alive. Otherwise, our Congress is useless. It was almost 20 minutes when she finally finished her prayer. The speaker who was supposed to speak came up 
and just said, Amen, Amen. Let us continue to listen to God, not to me. And we're sitting down. For me, that, that was the highland of the Lausanne Congress, and many people who were there still say that was the, the turning point. Because it really hit each one right between the eye. At least it hit me. A question to you, my friend. One of the most important documents of that Congress was the Lausanne Covenant. Have you heard about it? Have you read it? Do you remember certain passages of the Lausanne Covenant? Do you have a copy at home that you could read? Question. Do you have a copy? Do you know the Covenant, Lausanne Covenant? No? Anybody? I'm sure someone must know the Lausanne Covenant. Yeah, one, two, three, yeah. Later on, when we have a lively discussion where everyone will participate and I will watch, you will get a free copy. I have I bought one for each one of you, a copy of the Lausanne Covenant for you to take with you. I also have a little book booklet which uh, explains the Lausanne Covenant by John Stott. Beautiful little booklet, has about uh, 62 pages. You can buy it for five dollars. Usually it's ten, but since we are in the family, you get it half price. Many theologians were involved in preparing this central document of the Congress. More than three thousand comments, critiques, and concerns were received. And John Stott, who was not only the chief architect of this document, he also wrote a final version. Leighton Ford wrote, what emerged was not only a statement of the theology or practice of world evangelization, but a covenant to keep and a commitment to work and pray and plan together. Dr. Spurzner stated, Many regard this covenant as the most significant mission document to produce in modern Protestant era. The covenant has given an evangelical definition to world evangelization. It has also provided a framework for unity among Christians globally and formed a basis for many projects. At the end, Almost all of the participants, the 4,000, signed that Congress, as I did as well. It became my statement of faith. The Lausanne Congress, the Lausanne Covenant, excuse me, the Lausanne Covenant has 15 concise chapters, each with many specific Bible references. It said, adopted. I have adopted the Lausanne Covenant as my personal statement of faith. When I put together, and probably you have, a kind of a CV, who you are, what you have done, and what God allowed you to do, and what you have published, and all that kind of stuff, I put all that together, and in the end, I added the Lausanne Covenant is my personal statement of faith. I believe in it, in the entire document. The Lausanne Covenant has become a statement of faith of countless churches, denomination, mission agencies, and theological institutes. And I have recommended that document to professors of theology, of pastors, of leaders who teach next generation. Use that document. It is probably one of the best documents there is as a guideline for biblical ministry. 
You can use it to teach your elders, to teach your mission committee, to teach people in your church. Use it as a study guide. It's a tremendous tool. Therefore, you will receive one. The Lausanne Congress became a movement, not a structure or an organization or a mission agency. After the Congress in Lausanne, a follow-up meeting took place in, in 1975 in Mexico City. It was not an easy meeting, attempting to agree on the future direction of the movement. Billy Graham and John Stott convinced the Continuation Committee that their mandate was to further the total biblical mission of the Church, not just one aspect. The first full-time international director of the movement was Gottfried Hasemenser from Ghana. He served from 75 to 1984. Since then, the Lausanne movement had six international directors, and at present it is Michael O, oh, a Korean-American living in Philadelphia. The second, the second Lausanne Congress was held in Manila in July of 1989. Hayden Ford was the chairman. The theme of the Congress was proclaiming Christ until he comes, calling the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Beautiful statement. The Manila Manifesto, the, the, the document which people signed, was again finalized by John Stutt. And it begins with 25 affirmations and 12 short, concise chapters with many Bible references. I had the privilege to attend that Congress in Manila. I represented World Vision Central Europe, of which I was the founder and the president. The third Lausanne Congress took place in Cape Town, South Africa in October 2010. Much has been written about a Cape Town meeting. A large delegation, nearly 100, attended from Canada. And I think you were there, your wife also. Anybody else? The theme was Christ the Reconciler, based on 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Christopher Wright was the chief architect of the very extensive Cape Town commitment, a confession of faith and a call to action. Beautiful, beautiful statement. If you want to read something new and fresh, read the Cape Town commitment. Again, an 80 page booklet. I have with me that you can purchase for $5 if you like to. My wife and I have served before and during the Cape Town Congress in the communication department. We were working on one hour summary what happened every day. So a whole day of the Congress we had to put together in one hour. What a job it was. And that was sent every day to 700 colleges and seminaries around the world so they could participate at that meeting. From 2007 to 2010, I worked on a revision of the structure and governance of the Lausanne movement, which was presented to the executive leadership team. For the last eight years, I have served as a co-catalyst with Bishop Ephraim Tendero, the Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance, providing the leadership for the integrity and anti-corruption network. The Lausanne movement has 30 different networks. They're all coordinated by David Bennett. Then the Lausanne movement divided the world into 12 regions. I put up a map if you want to look at it later by color. 
12 regions and each one has a regional director. They all report to Vice President Lars Newman from Jamaica. In addition to attending the three global congresses, Lausanne, Manila, Cape Town, have had the privilege of attending many Lausanne meetings, conferences, workshops, leadership gatherings. I believe in the vision and mission of the Lausanne movement. I also have put together a list of about 10 important books uh, for you to take with you. If you like to take one, you can read some of the material that helped me to prepare to be factual. So in summary, I have given you 21 points. I talked to you about the Lausanne, the history, its ministry, and I ask a few questions. But now it is time for you to ask and talk and to share. So the second hour is ours. Thank you for listening. May God help for you to understand what it means to have a concept of evangelism and sending the good news of Jesus Christ to people who have not heard. Thank you.